ృతిస్మృతిపురా ఆలయం కరుణాలయం నమామి భగవత్పాదం శంకరం లోకశంకరం in the last class we were studying the one of the powers of the maya this as we mentioned that the maya is having three powers what are the three powers of maya vikshepa shakti avarana shakti and the gyana shakti so that with a common example we try to explain that in the twilight hours when i am seeing a snake in a rope what happens first the knowledge of the rope is concealed once it is concealed then it is projected as something else so this maya has this first these two powers this for the power of concealment there is only one reality the brahman the non dual conscious principle which is appearing as this world just as the way the rope appears as the snake so similarly here also the brahman the reality of the brahman is being concealed by maya so that's the power of concealment is the avarana shakti avarana means concealment once it is concealed it e it appears as something else just as the snake and the rope appears as snake similarly here it is the brahman which is being projected as this universe so once it is concealed it is projected as something else that is the power of projection that is the vikshepa shakti now as we were indicating but this is not something which has to go on that once i see a snake in a rope that doesn't mean i have to see it through eternity someone may help me out she so brings the torch and focuses and says see see it's not the thing to be scared of it is not the snake it is just the rope so after hearing his words and after seeing it with the focus of the light then the ignorance vanishes so this the power of the maya itself again to reveal the reality by getting rid of the ignorance that is called the gyana shakti so the first two avarana and the vikshepa these two powers are the cause of the bondage but we shouldn't all just blame maya that it has kept us in the bondage because within it is also inherent the power to release us from this bondage the power of liberation and that's the third power the that is called the gyana shakti as sri ramakrishna you will find in the gospel again and again he is saying the god has two aspects of maya vidya maya and avidya maya so here in this context we can say that the avarana shakti and the vikshepa shakti is the avidya maya and the gyana shakti is the vidya maya that the process by which by we can get beyond this ignorance that's the gyana shakti that also is in the realm of maya sri ramakrishna's examples are wonderful to uh, uh, are wonderful they can explain the things very very lucidly in simple way as sri ramakrishna says that when you are passing through a forest you are pricked by a thorn the thorn pierces gets prick you are pricked by the thorn now to get rid of the thorn what we do from the same thorny bush we pluck out another thorn and use this second thorn to pierce or to just pluck out the first thorn which has pierced me so the same plant from which i am using the second thorn so this but this is helping me to get rid of the thorn which has already pierced me so the first thorn which has pierced me is the avidya maya that is the avarana shakti and the vikshepa shakti the second thorn with which i am getting rid of the first thorn that is the gyana shakti so it is the same uh, thorn the same aspect of maya another aspect of maya 
with which I am getting rid of the Maya. So that's the three Shaktis which we have give, given an introduction and we started our discussion on the Vikshepa Shakti. That once the reality is concealed, it is projected as something else. And once it is projected as something else, it finds manifestation in our life in particular way as reaction. So that was indicated in the 111th verse which we studied as a concluding verse in the last class. So what's the verse? Vikshepa Shakti Rajasa Kriyatmika Yata Pravritti Prasuta Purani Ragadaya Asya Prabhavanti Nityam Dukkhadaya Ye Manasa Vikara So Vikshepa Shakti Once the reality is consoled and it finds expression as something else as we give that example, that when we were in deep sleep, the entire world has vanished for me. It was nothing there. Was it really not there? No. The concept of the entire world was in my mind. It was just in the dormant state. When I wake up, open my eyes, I see a red flower in the garden. What happens? With the stimuli, all the idea, ideas which were dormant in my mind, any the particular idea which corresponds to what that stimuli, that flower, that reveals. So the tamas is getting converted into sattva, revelation, illumination. Once the illumination is there, as per my temperament, I get motivated to do certain type of action. If I am a devotee, I move out. What's the reaction? I move out, pluck the flower, bring it and offer it in the altar. If I am a lover of flowers, I am a gardener, then I won't pluck it. I will water the plant, I will apply fertilizer so that more flower may grow. So I take care. So what's the my response will be depends on my temperament, my sanskaras. So these reactions which ensues uh, after the stimuli, when the stimuli activates the tamas, the, all the things which were lying hidden in my mind, the dormant, accordingly as correspondingly one reaction is there, that speaks of the rajas, activity, still the response to the stimuli is the activity and that speaks of the vikshepa shakti. How and why it is vikshepa? Because it is actually the self and self alone which coming in association with the mind breaks into the spectrum of this world of name and form. So. It is a vikshepa. It is a self which is appearing as the universe and seeing that universe, I get motivated to particular type of actions. So that's why it has been mentioned, vikshepa sakti rajasa. This rajas speaks of the reaction and this reaction is always I uh, uh, follow certain action. Just as we give that example in the microbe, when I am watching, watching a microbe in a petri dish through the microscope, if I give nutrient, it is drawn towards it. If I give some toxin, it moves away from it. For a particular stimuli, it reacts in a particular way. So this speaks of Kriya, of action. So Kriyatmika, once I get attached with the body, mind complex, and think this to be the be all and end all of my existence. So anything which favors its existence, I get drawn towards it. Anything which is not favorable to its existence, I get repelled by it. So that speaks of the fight and flight response, dvesha abhinivesha. So these are the reactions. That speaks of the kriya. Yata pravritti, so all the pravritti, all the, that what you see this activity, pravritti speaks of the activity, which has, eman, it has emanated from this rajas, from this vikshepa shakti, from the from the permeable times. It is a permeable, it is, it is anadi, it is going on. That's why it is yata pravritti prasuta purani. From when it has started, we don't know. It is going on. That because of ignorance, when I see the Brahman, the non dual consciousness as this world, I think myself as a limited being, and here the world outside is there, which can either nourish me or it can harm me, and accordingly I react to it in particular ways. That speaks of the action from when it has started, I don't know. It's Purana, Anadi. 
and that's the pravritti which has generated which has been generated by the action pravritti means moving out nivritti means withdrawing when i again will realize that i am the self nothing can kill me nothing can annihilate me i am as i am there is no need for satiation for me i am already fulfilled then will come the nivritti there is no need of going out so that will happen with the annihilation of ignorance but till then it is all pravritti it's moving out so it is purana when it started we don't know so ragadaya asya prabhavanti nitya how how this thing is uh, motivated that how uh, that we get motivated towards action this that speaks of prabhavanti 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 means gets motivated how do get we get motivated towards action ragadaya as raga means attachment adha means adi means that attachment also is followed by krodha as in the next sloka it was when my attachment to something is obscured someone hinders it it will find expression as anger it will find expression as moha if i am get too much attached to it i will find expression as greed or delusion so all those various uh, this what you say this uh, emotive faculties all these feelings that are generated from that actions so this ragi raga adasya prabhavanti nityam from that it is being ensued and it results in what dukkhadaya this there is an eternal dissatisfaction i think that i have a need for something in the external world something is there the moment i gratify myself i satiate myself i uh, get the pleasure out of it i think i will be satiated but i find that there is no satiation the more i enjoy the more the craving increases just like pouring fuel in the fire the more i pour the more the fire flares up so that's the meaning of dukkha dissatisfaction there's a tremendous dissatisfaction there is no as such fulfillment of this desire so this results in dukkha dukkhadaya ya manasa vikara all the afflictions of the mind all the so called and these mental afflictions like attachment etc are because uh, of this uh, rajas uh, this rajas which is this kriya from this kriya we never feel and uh, we, we resort to action that action never enables us to reach satiation and from that ensues dukkha dissatisfaction so this is the uh, this is the krama the sequence in which the vikshepa shakti finds expression in our life as it has been mentioned that i can never see the three gunas of the prakriti sattva rajas tamas but by their effect we can know that as cause they are there so that's that's how the rajas finds expression as the kriyatmika shakti which results in ragadaya this all this raga and uh, other emotive faculties and at last it results in dukkha only in dissatisfaction so we again and again we should have we will say we will just remind that dukkha means dissatisfaction it doesn't mean suffering though one may feel that both are of same meaning but both have but, but both have a subtle difference that this suffering is not dissatisfaction that when you are enjoying a delicacy which you like most and if i ask you are you suffering of course not you are enjoying but if i ask are you satisfied immediately a question mark will be there in your mind because you have already developed the craving for the second that i finish this i will have another one so not satisfied so when dukkha when we say that uh, dukkha is suffering it's a wrong translation dukkha means dissatisfaction that we are never satisfied so though we may temporarily feel happy we may feel very suffering life has so many uh, instances where we do enjoy why should we say that we are suffering it's a pessimistic attitude but that's only when we translate dukkha in a wrong way so it has never mentioned it is suffering it has mentioned it is dissatisfaction that though we are enjoying it never gives us satiation 
no fulfillment. That's why when life, at the end of life, we find that in spite of all the things we got, everything has been taken away and we die dejected because we thought that in the fulfillment of the pleasures of life lies the ultimate goal of life. That was a wrong, uh, mistaken notion. We can never reach that satiation. At last we will be dejected if we have that type of wrong paradigm. So that's the meaning of the word Dukkha. So this is the slope with which, verse with which we ended our class uh, in, the, in the previous week. So now the next week and then the next sloka speaks of that in the last sloka it was mentioned that Raga Day, that Raga attachment and Adi, those are the results from the Kriyatmika Shakti because of the Rajas. So what are those Adi? What are those other aff uh, these afflictions which has been spoken of this in details in the next verse? What are they? Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Dambha, Abhyasuya, Ahankar, Irsha, Matsarad, Matsaradya, Tu Ghoraha, Dharma, Ete, Rajasa, Pum Prabritti, Yasmat, Esha, Tat, Rajo, Vandha, Hetu. So what are these? The desire, this karma is the desire, Krodha is anger, Lobha is greed, Dambha is arrogance. We will come to the ex subtle difference between this word. Dambha, Ahankara may appear to be same but there is a subtle difference. Dambha means this arrogance. Abhyasuya is spite. What it actually means we will come. Ahankara is the ego. Irsha is the envy. Matsara is the jealousy. And these are the various Adi refers to Adi refers to the Moha and Mother and Dambha. You know that six Shararipu. So here Moha and Mother is not mentioned. So that Adi indicates that Moha and Mother. So these all these uh, what you say this uh, characteristics these are the, all these characteristics of Rajas results from actions that uh, which we are motivated to uh, uh, in response to all the stimuli. And from where the stimuli comes? From the projection that the Brahman appears as the world. That actually this appearance acts as the stimuli to which we respond and in the process of responding these all various mental vikar, this mental uh, afflictions results in the form of Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Dambha, Abhyasuya, Ahankar, Isha, Matsara. So, so what are they actually? This uh, Let us try to understand. Kama is desire. We understand that when even in Bhagavad Gita they say that that what you say that Kama comes from Sangha. Sangat kama, this Kama Upajayate. This, when I am just uh, say just in a, shop, in a shopping mall I am passing through various shops I as such have no plan to buy any specific thing but seeing a particular jacket I stop I look at it I feel that it is a thing uh, which uh, is something which will fit on me so just by sung, by attach, just by standing in front of it and by in my association with it, in no time, I have developed a sense of possession that I have to get it. This should be my jacket. So this speaks of the desire, the the desire that it was in the shop, it was not mine. Now I want it to be mine. So this. Desire to get the thing is being known, known as karma. Now, the one who is accompanying me, he says, oh, it's not good. It's of no use. You have uh, another four or five jackets. Why you want to buy another? And he desists me. From that, what will happen? Anger will come. Krodha. So, I am uh, having the desire to get it and you are constantly desisting me. You don't understand my need. So this, from that, so whenever the desire is obstructed, from that comes Krodha. And if the desire is not obstructed, then from the desire comes Lobha, greed. If it is obstructed, then comes Krodha. If it is not obstructed, then it results in greed. From the greed, when I acquire it, once I get, 
Then the dambha comes. What's the dambha? Arrogance. That is the display of your of all one's qualities. That you want to show off. See, I have this, I have that. So that spoke of speaks of dambha. That once I acquired the thing, I want to make I want to show off. That's the dambha. Abhyasuya speaks of spite. What is spite? It's just the intolerance of the prosperity of others. I want to show off and someone has more wealth than me and that makes me very much intolerant. Intolerance of the prosperity of others is the abhyasuya. Ahankar is the ego, the consciousness of one's superiority. That when you really acquire a lot of things, you make a show off and at the same time the ego also develops. That I am superior to others. I am more wealthy. I am uh, having more name and fame. I am more powerful. All this idea of superiority has been spoken of here as ahankar. And Irsha, what it speaks of envy. What is envy actually? That when I find someone to be really good, but I don't want to accept that fact, that finds expression as Isha. Then what will I do? I will be interpreting the good qualities as bad. That he's that not so good. What people, that it appears to be. It's he's not so. He's not what he appears to be. And I will be trying to scandalize him, interpreting the good things as bad. That has been spoken of as Isha. And what is Matsara is the jealousy. There's not to part with the things which are meant for all. Just you will find that when we are supposed to inherit whether a father, a, one person has three children. And when the question of inheritance comes, you find there's a fight. Though there is a, they all are supposed to share equally. But all want to, out of greed, all want to have the more share, the maximum share. So though all inherit the property, but they all will be fighting for the share of the inheritance, how much share they have. So what it speaks of? That speaks of Matsara jealousy, tendency not to part with the things which is meant for all. And Adi, as we told, is the moha, that when we get, uh, what you say, attached to a thing, then we will find what we will find that we lose the capacity of discrimination. We start thinking only of the positivities, positive qualities of that thing, the negativities, though it is there, it's hidden from my view. Somehow I develop a blind spot of all those things. So that speaks of moha. You find that everyone says that, as Sri Ramakrishna because very funnily says, that whomever I ask, they, uh, that how is your uh, life partner, companion? They will say, oh, it's wonderful. So why it happens? That isn't it that uh, they have uh, no negative qualities? They may have, but the moha works. That it makes us feel a thing, what it is not. So that speaks of the infatuation. And then mother, which also, it includes the dambha. And that already we spoke of dambha and ahankara. This dambha and ahankara together speaks of this mother, which we has not been uh, enlisted here, because uh, this uh, Dambha and Ahankara together speaks of mother. So these, all these mental afflictions develops because of that Kriyatmika Shakti of the Rajas. Once I develop the Pravritti to move out and acquire things, all these mental afflictions come from it. So these are said to be Ghora, as we find that yeah, what has mentioned Ahankara, Isha, mats, Matsaradi, to Ghora. Ghora, what is the Ghora? Ghora means that they are the cause. Why they are called Ghora? Ghora means here, sterile, horrendous. Why they are horrendous? Because they are the cause of the dissatisfaction, eternal dissatisfaction within us, as we were indicating. We never get satiated. From that, all the danger comes. Because uh, once you are dissatisfied from that, Krodha, anger, envy, all those core all those mental afflictions rises, arises. And that results in all sorts of dangers for me, for others. So that's why it is called Ghora. And these characteristics are called Rajasa because the man subject to them does not refrain from action anytime. Constantly he is chasing after this one worldly means and again another. So it is constantly going on. So that's why it is called Rajasa. Rajasa means reaction, as we told. 
that it always results in that reaction that action constantly that action is going on so that's why it is rajasa so this this they result in the dissatisfaction hence may men go on chasing for them without getting any satisfaction so that's being in, and that's results in the bondage that's this yasmat esha tat rajo vandha hetu what is the cause of the bondage the cycle of avidya kama karma because of ignorance kama the desire develops the desire entails in action and this cycle goes on life after life and that's the cause of bondage so that's how the in details all the mental afflictions will results results from rajas has been explained in the 112th verse the next verse now will speak in this 111th and the 112th verse spoke of the vikshepa shakti of maya now from the 113th to the 116th these verses will describe the avarana shakti of maya the counseling power of maya that first comes concealment then comes projection first the real nature of the ultimate reality is obscured and then it is projected as the world so first the effect was described the projection was described now the concept of power which conceals the reality that will be described so what is that avarana shakti that is described in the 113th verse it starts with that what is that esha avritti nama tamo gunasya shakti yaya vastu avabhasate anyatha sa esha nidanam purushasya sanskrite vikshepa shakte pravanasya hetuhu so this avritti avarana shakti is, is called avritti is the veiling power esha avritti nama tamo gunasya shakti it is the power uh, of this it is the power of tamas the tamo guna as we told us maya has three uh, gunas satya raja tama from rajas came the vikshepa shakti from tamas comes the avarana shakti the power of concealment so what is that power of concealment this uh, this veiling power is the power of tamas which makes thing appear other than what they are because of concealment then comes the projection so as they conceal they appear yatha vastu avabhasate anyatha so it makes the thing appear as something else because of this concealment and then it is the it is this that causes man's repeated transmigration the sanskriti purushasya sanskrite sa esha nidanam purushasya sanskrite this is the cause of the transmigration and vikshepa shakte pravanasya and from it the vikshepa shakti the power of projection is emanates from this power of concealment so in this first uh, sloka which which enunciates the avarana shakti we find that the avarana shakti has two powers so what are the two powers that first that it will be concealing my real reality real uh, real nature <clears throat> and as a result the ego will be generated the idea that i am this limited body mind complex this happens because of that concealment of my reality the brahman appears as this uh what you say this limited individuality where one one identifies oneself with the body mind complex so this happens because of the avarana shakti and this results in the transmigration how it happens as we have described it so many times in some different contexts that when the non dual consciousness gets reflected in the body mind complex the conscious principle now identifies itself with the reflection and takes the reflection to be real and takes the reflection to be its identity the other way to understand it is the ego i am standing in front of a mountain and i am shouting out my own name and i feel someone is as if calling me from the mountain there's a ego so it is a mistaken notion no one is calling me from the mountains it is my voice which has been echoed back so similarly the self when it is in association with the body mind complex the self is saying i am eternal 
I am fulfilled. From the body-mind complex, that ego is coming. I am eternal. I am fulfilled. Now, I get identified with that ego and try to realize this eternity and fulfillment through the body-mind complex. Just as I take an example, a small micro. What does that example we are give again and again that when I am seeing through the microscope, if I give nutrient, it is drawn towards it. Why? The same non-dual principle, when it gets reflected in that micro body, it thinks itself to the micro body, and within it, from within that micro body, as someone is as if saying, "You are eternal, you are ever fulfilled." And now the micro body finds that someone is saying, "You are eternal." But I know that external stimuli can kill me or it can even nourish me. So anything which is nourishing, which is favorable for its existence, it is getting drawn towards it. So if I give nutrients, it gets drawn towards it. If I give some toxin, it moves away from it. So why it's happening? Because someone within is saying, you can never die. You're eternal. And we being bound in this delusion, constantly I'm trying to experience the eternity in the flow, which is never possible. This body-mind complex is a flow. It's never eternal. But because of the delusion we are trying, and in this process, the entire biological evolution happens. I'm trying to fight against nature. Nature annihilates me. The self within me again takes another body. It's fighting. In the, plan, in the process, evolution is happening. How? The cells will be conglomerating and there will be a division of labor so that they can fight with the nature in a better way, so that they can have a better life, more extended life. That's what we are trying, struggling, constantly fighting against nature. Why? To realize the thing within the body-mind complex which is never possible. But why we are doing that, the thing which is not possible? Because of the delusion. After hearing the echo from the body-mind complex that you are eternal, that you are something which is ever fulfilled, we are trying to realize that eternity, that fulfillment within the body-mind complex which is never possible and in the process evolution is happening. Life after life, we are chasing after that desire which can never be fulfilled through the body-mind complex. That speaks of the transmigration. Just see a small bacteria. A little change of stimuli can kill it. As a human being, we are more we're better equipped. There's a homostasis working. That even with the change of temperature, my body temperature doesn't change. Why? As a conglomerated unit with the division of labor, we have been more evolved to fight in a much better way with the nature. But still, can you realize eternity? No. Maybe we have succeeded to a certain extent to fight with the nature and have a bit prolonged life. But is it ever possible to realize the eternity in this physical world? Never. However we may try. So, but as a human being, a time comes when we realize that we are already eternal. We are already fulfilled. It is because of taking the ego to be the reality I was deluded. The one who is saying the, that I am eternal, I am fulfilled, is not the ego which is coming. It is the self which is in association with the body-mind complex. But it is never a part of it. It is never identified with it. It is something separate from it. When I know that, then I know I am already eternal. I am already fulfilled. What's the this useless chase of uh, uh, searching eternity and fulfillment through the body-mind complex, there is no need. And then the renunciation comes, the first stage of spiritual evolution, vairagya. Enough of it, enough of this chasing. Let the body-mind complex uh, exhaust itself by its prarabdha karma, but I am no more going to get identified with it. Then this separation comes. But till that separation comes, that avarana shakti is working, resulting in sanskriti. Now I will understand that when it is saying that sa esha nidanam purushasya sanskriti, it causes the transmigration because once the ego comes to picture, 
I get identified with this limited body-mind complex. And this ego is making me to go round and round the cycle of birth and death uh, through, the process, through the cycle of avidya, kama, karma. From ignorance, the desire came, the desire is in action. This goes on, life after life. That's being indicated by the word purushasya sanskrite. And that is one, that is one of the functions that it results in transmigration. Another that has already been described. From it, the vikshepa shakti emanates. Vikshepa shakti pravanasya hetuhu. That it is the cause of the vikshepa shakti. The wrong projection of the serpent arising on the concealment of the rope produces fear, etc. So the ones, so from where all those mental afflictions come, if the rope is in no way going to create any mental affliction, but when I see the snake in the rope, fear may develop. I will be scared. I will try to run away from it. So from where all these mental afflictions and its consequence kriya actions are emanating because of the projection, because of the vikshepa shakti. The reality has been concealed and it has been projected as something else. Then it comes. So this vikshepa shakti is the thing which results from that avarana shakti. It results in that. So that has been spoken of here. So while rajas and tamas are the cause of bondage, the superior power of tamas is conveyed, uh, uh, will be conveyed not now in, in, in some succeeding verse. That is the, uh, what you say, that the jnana shakti, the sattva. That will be from the 117th, 18th verse, it will be uh, described. But now, from uh, this, uh, uh, till 116, 113, 14, 15, 16, these four verses will describe the various aspects of this Avarana Shakti. So now, the 114th verse, what it is saying? That even for the wise, those who have heard that I am not the, I am not this body-mind complex and the Atman. I have read the scripture, I have heard. I have went for holy company. I have done satsanga and from them I have heard. And that way I am wise. To a certain extent I am wise. I have an intellectual understanding that I am the self. But even for them, the Avarana Shakti, as long as it has not been removed, it goes on deluding us and it results in dukkha. So what is saying? Pragyavanapi, Panditopi, Chaturopi, Atyanta Shukshmatmadrik, Vyalira, Tamasa, Navetti, Vahuda, Sanghodhita, Api, Sputam, Brantya, Aropitam, Eva, Sadhu Kalayati, Alambate, Tat Gunan, Hanta Asau, Prabala, Duranta Tamasa, Shakti Mahati Avriti. So this Sanskrit is wonderful. If we break, you will find that uh, these words have very wonderful meaning. That let us go by one by one. That even for a man of wisdom, Pragyavanapi, Panditapi, one who is learned, learned in scriptures, learned in scriptures. So for Pandita, Chatura, he may be clever. This Chaturopi, Atyanta Shukshmatmadrik, one who has the capacity of very subtle discrimination, shukshma atmadrik, shukshma, shukshma atmadrik, shukshma atmadrik, drik, this, that atma is the drik, everything is the drishya, the one who has the subtle capacity to discriminate between this drik and the drishya, that atma, drik, who knows that I am the atman, and even for him, even for such person, they are overpowered. Vyalida. Vyalida means overpowered. Tamasa by the tamas. Navetti vahudha sangbhodita apisputam. That even they do, they, they do not realize the nature of Atman, though repeatedly and clearly taught that Navetti vahudha, in various ways we have been, uh, we have, it has been taught, sangbhodita, in various ways. In various ways, clearly it has been taught. But still it doesn't foot, it doesn't really reveal my real nature. It remains just as an intellectual understanding. So then what happens? Bhrantya Aropitam Eva. This 
he considers what is superimposed by his delusion as true. That's the thing. Bhrantya arupitam eva sadhu khalayati and attaches himself to its qualities. So that just you will understand that when in meditation I am feeling great. I sit down, I say I am Atman, I am Brahman. Who is saying? It is the mind. It creates a type of uh, uh, what you say this tranquility in my mind. A bliss emanates from it. And I think I have realized the self. But it is just the mind which is saying I am the self. It has created to a certain extent a tranquility in my mind. But is it really the self? No. In no way. Still I am attached to the mind. So it is Bhranta. So though even I am just discriminating, I am having the idea that I am the self, this is giving me this type of pleasure. But still I am actually attached to my body-mind complex. It is the attachment to the mind. As Swami Vivekananda very nicely used to say, very nicely used to say that golden chain is also a chain, iron chain is also a chain. A man who is deluded, who has nothing to do with the knowledge of Atman, he is as if bound with the iron chain. The one who gets happiness because of this Shukshma Atmudrik, constantly contemplating that I am the Atman. For him, this still it is a bondage because still this happiness which is coming, which is coming, is coming because of the attachment to that mind only. A particular state of the mind to which it is he is attached. From that he is getting the bliss. He has not gone beyond the mind. So that also is a bondage. That is not going to liberate him. So he has to be born again as what you say that the one who gets attached to this type of mental contemplation will be born with good sanskaras. He will be born with good sanskaras but he will have to continue uh, with another lives after life with this type of meditation that I am the Atman and he enjoys the happiness the bliss comes out of it but he doesn't can uh, transcend the mind with the quantum jump that's why they say that even in spiritual life one of the biggest hindrance is this bliss which comes out of meditation from there to take a quantum leap, leap is something very diff difficult Vairagya we may see Vairagya in many, but Para Vairagya, the supreme renunciation, is something very difficult. So here we will find that when this sloka is explaining the Avarana Shakti, it is actually speaking of that a person may have attained Vairagya, but not Para Vairagya. We will go to the explanation and still in a better way so that this makes sense. Hanta Asau Pravala Duranta Tamasa Shakti Mahati Avriti. So this counseling power of Tamas, which makes for untold hardships is great indeed. It's very difficult to transcend it. It's really very great. So what it speaks of? That we know that the path of realization is Sravana, Manana, Nividhyasana. Now Sravana, when we hear the truth from the scriptures or from the Guru, from the Holy Company, there are a lot of doubts in my mind. I'm not very clear I don't have a very clear understanding of what has been spoken of. So from so that, that's why it has been mentioned that after hearing, you cogitate upon it. Manana. So for that, Shraddha is required. I don't doubt that this is uh, the knowledge which has been spoken of is something nonsense. It do have some essential truth in it, that faith I have, and then I go on cogitating upon it. In the process, what happens? my understanding becomes clearer. Now I have a very clear understanding of the concept of Atman, of the soul which has been spoken of in the scriptures. But now if I get that conviction that I have attained everything, I will be doing a big mistake. The scripture says there is another step, it is called Nididhyasana. That once you get it, that mental, mental uh, uh, there is this intellectual uh, conviction, intellectual understanding, you have to now meditate upon this inter intellectual conviction till it takes you to a realization which helps you to go beyond the so-called the domain of the mind to get established in the self. So that's the Nididhyasa. Till that happens, 
it is just mere intellectual conviction so this intellectual cannot remove the duranta tamasa the tremendous power of tamas it cannot remove unless manana is followed by nidhi dhyasana so many times we have repeated these stories which are very important that our condition as swami ji says is just like a stag a stag is a male deer that a male deer one day was bragging its strength it was just standing by the side of a reservoir and seeing its own muscular limbs it was bragging to the fawn the young deer standing near see how strong i am and suddenly the stag heard the barking of a dog it didn't even see just heard from a long distance it could hear the barking of the dog and this stag started running frantically the fawn was also following it after a long distance totally exhausted the stag stopped and now the fawn asked just now you were so confident about your strength what happened what made you so frightened and then the stag says that i don't know what happens to my confidence when i hear the barking of a dog so now you will understand what has been spoken of in this shloka that after reading the scriptures we start meditating when the ch- we are not facing the challenges of life in my meditation room i am quite happy it gives me a conviction that i have understood the scriptures and it has helped me to attain the tranquility now i get up from my meditation i just try to interact with the world and then i find i get totally disturbed this realization in no way helps me to really encounter the world the challenges of the world i try to run away from it so now you will understand that i actually have not realized it was just an intellectual conviction as sri ramakrishna says that you may teach a parrot the name of rama it will go on chanting but if someone comes and tries to just throw what you say this uh, squeeze its throat it has to suffocate it tries to suffocate it immediately its original wild tone will come out so for us also the repeating of the scripture is just like that it has not really created any conviction as sri ramakrishna used to say that however you may go on saying that i am the brahman just a small thorn pricks you and you just shout out in pain that shows i am still identified with the body mind i am still identified with the body mind complex what i am saying doesn't reflect in reality so that's being indicated so still that concealment is there that i my uh, that uh, sometimes i just i relate an incident a very funny incident what that a small girl she gets very easily frightened whenever she is playing with other with her other friends they they know that she gets very easily f- frightened that they will make some face they make some face and she gets scared and she starts running she will cry and she will run she will run to her mother and the mother finds that this her child gets so easily scared so one day she tries to give her some suggestion see when someone scares scares you just say yourself from within that what is there to fear be very bold say what is there to fear and now the next day when again the other children frightens the girl the girl again runs runs to its mother crying but constantly repeating what's there to fear so what's that that he has learned those words but in no way she can relate to that she is just repeating what is there to fear but she is crying and running it has those words as such has no effect in has no effect in her day to day dealing with the life so that's the thing which has been indicated here but does any real change come yes come there's something called realization that through nidhi dhyasana we go to a stage which is beyond the mind and when the as we uh, give that example that white light is falling on the prism breaking down into the spectrum of the seven colors this world is the spectrum the prism is the mind white light is the ult- ultimate reality absolute reality through spiritual practice 
we can remove the prism as such as as if we can get rid of the prism and then what happens to the spectrum it becomes one with the white light it merges in the white light and then i realize this is just a projection that the reality is this white light it is because of the mind this was appearing as this world so this realization comes only when the prism is removed otherwise the spectrum is still there and i am just mentally repeating i am the brahman i can never realize that through sadhana through nididhyasana this prism has to be removed that there has to be an interval in our life where this life if that this life is a movie there has to be an interval that wonderful story which we relate so many times i have heard it from some other in some other context that a small child was going to watch the movie for the first time with his father and the father was explaining what the movie is that it is just the projection of light on the screen and the screen becomes vivid it becomes enlivened the all the uh, various scenes are enacted there so this child heard and when he went to the movie theater the movie has already started they were bit late now the child was sitting by the side of the father and he was asking where is the screen the father just pointed just in the front and the, it was the scene of the mahabharata which was going on the krishna was instructing arjuna just before the battle so seeing krishna sitting in the front of the chariot the father pointed towards the screen the child thought krishna to be the screen then is krishna the screen no father again told is behind is behind that Oh, is Arjuna the screen? No, it's behind. Oh, the chariot, the battlefield, the sky which I see. There's a backdrop, backdrop behind the battlefield. He went on questioning. The father went on, couldn't explain. He was, he got fed up. The child was again and again. He was asking, "Where is the screen?" And then came the interval. There was an interval, and after the interval, the movie started. now the child was silent what has happened when the projection interval the projection stopped the screen was vividly visible now the child knows what the screen is after that the movie starts now he is silent he knows these are all projection of the light he has once he have screen seen the screen then there cannot be any more delusion so in our life that interval never comes the projection is going on through nididhyasana we can go to that state where the projection stops there's an interval after that again the projection may start but once i have went to that interval no one can delude me i have known but if that interval has not come then what happens this another story of this movie the same movie that another person he has also heard that movie is nothing but the projection of the light went to watch the movie and he thought that sitting in the front seat he can watch very nicely that there's a best way to see the movie uh, very vividly is to sit in the front seat so he went and sat in the front seat and it was some uh, the um, uh, scene of some wild life some rhinoceros was chasing uh, it was just chasing and seeing the rhinoceros chasing this man got up from the screen and started running uh, towards the exit the others the, uh, the who were watching the movie they were why are you running so don't you see that rhinoceros is chasing then they told after it's the movie it's not real it's projection and this man told well you know that it's a projection i also know it's a projection but the rhinoceros doesn't know the same thing happens with us we hear about vedanta we think i understand all those who were my so called co religious uh, traveler they also understand but when i go back home and my other family members shout at me they are the rhinoceros they don't understand so why this uh, this uh, idea of me and him comes that because i have never really gone beyond the projection to understand that it's a mere projection it cannot affect the real me so this is the idea this from these two stories you can easily understand what has been spoken of in this look that even the pragyavan 
the so called wise who have this read the scriptures listened to the words of the realized soul but is yet to realize it within for him the avarna shakti is still there as swami vivekananda again that says that gives that wonderful example that he as a paribrajaka was traveling through the desert and he was extremely thirsty extremely thirsty he was in search of water and then he suddenly saw a huge reservoir at a distance he started moving towards it and suddenly the reservoir vanished and then he realized oh it's a mirage that i have read about mirage in the textbook i had a very clear understanding of it i thought i know what mirage is but for the first time i have realized it it was just an intellectual knowledge today for the first time i realized then what's the result next day again when i am passing through the desert uh, desert as i am within my body mind senses again i see the mirror that yesterday i understood that it is a mere projection that doesn't mean i won't see it i see it again as i am in my body mind senses i see it again but today there is a great difference what's the difference that vikshepa shakti cannot work that it cannot pull me yesterday it dragged me it was dragging i thought it real that it dragged me i was going towards it to quench my thirst today i know it's just a projection i am seeing it but i am fully convinced so it has lost the power to drag me so till that realization i mean have studied about the mirage i may have a very clear understanding intellectual understanding but still it will pull me till i realize it so conceptual knowledge is not realization so this we have to understand that avarna shakti is not removed just by mere conceptual knowledge the conceptual knowledge has to end up in realization then only it can fall off so that's the idea which has been spoken of in the 114th verse so another two verses will speak of the avarna shakti which will again take up in the next class so with this we stop for discussion today thank you all namaskars